Welcome to Dow Talk. Today we have Clifton from the Arbitrum Foundation. He's the Dow Relations Lead, um, which is an interesting title. He's going to tell us all about what that means. Um, but Clifton has a uh, extensive background in Dow governance and protocol governance. Um, so we're going to just talk about governance in general, um, specifically hitting on what's happening in the Arbitrum DAO right now, um, with a particular focus on Security Council elections, which are active for voting. So, um, Clifton, welcome to DAO Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, of course, of course. So maybe you can just get us started. Tell tell us a little bit more about your background and kind of how you got into DAO governance and protocol governance leading into what you're working on today. Sure. So I... I guess I can start with the boring stuff like uh, my professional background. So I've been in product management for most of my career, uh, most notably at Twilio before I ventured full time into Web3. Um, and then how I actually got into uh, crypto in the first place was actually in 2017. So I was just one of those, you know, uh, dreamy headed individuals that wanted to make a fortune off of one of these ICOs. I didn't know what I was doing. Just, you know, heard about this like Bitcoin, Ethereum thing. And like, you know, in a day you could make over like 400 eggs of your money. And I was like, what the hell? Let's jump right in. Right. I lost a little bit of money there, but, you know, all a good learning experience. Um, but that was kind of like my um, intro into cryptocurrency. And then it was only until like 2020 where I really got went went deep down the rabbit hole, like read the Bitcoin white paper, Ethereum white paper learned all about smart contracts. I'm not technical by the way, but uh, being a product guy, you know, some of these like concepts uh, were intriguing to me. Um, and I started, you know, looking through a lot of DeFi uh, applications that were live. So OG, like Uniswap, like Maker, um, I, I put a little bit of funds everywhere just to, you know, test out all these different protocols and uh, really that dove into a lot of developer docs, just understanding like, how their architecture kind of works and what kind of problems they're trying to solve and how they actually intended to bring people into Web3 via their applications, right? Um, so I was actually always more interested on the applications front rather than like the underlying infrastructure, uh, which is kind of ironical since I currently work at Arbitrum, which is kind of like a base layer for builders to kind of build on top of. But that's kind of like my journey. And then um, prior to joining the Arbitrum Foundation, I was actually with uh, the DYDX Foundation. So I uh, was the governance lead there. I uh, was just like, you know, understanding a little bit more about how we could, you know, have a little bit more of an engaged ecosystem. Um, just because, you know, for DYDX specifically, it was very much like a trader community. Um, and I am not like the biggest like DGEN trader myself. So um, just you know, trying to find ways to route people up, just trying to find ways for them to be involved. Um, and I think most recently, like this migration over to like DYDX v4, which is a standalone Cosmos blockchain, like the governance challenges were, were, were very interesting uh, to work on. Uh, just understanding like how governance is going to change from an Ethereum environment over to like a Cosmos based ad chain. Um, so that, that was fun. Um, but, you know, um, I've always aligned a little bit more personally with like how um, the Ethereum ecosystem is and Ethereum value. So like when this role kind of like, popped up over on the Arbitrum side, like it was kind of a no brainer for me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my journey in, into the Arbitrum foundation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I know, as you mentioned, Arbitrum is, you know, maybe not, uh, it's more of infrastructure, kind of an infrastructure level, level DAO, level protocol. But I will say one thing I've noticed just kind of working with the Arbitrum community on governance is, um, you know, the the application layer of the Arbitrum ecosystem is increasingly very involved um, in Arbitrum governance. Um, so I'm I'm sure it's helpful to have that background, like working with working with with applications as you think about governance. Um, curious if actually if you can expand on that a little bit. Um, I know we've seen a lot of momentum around this idea of of incentives um, and a kind of other community and ecosystem driven proposals in the Arbitrum DAO. So curious if, if you have thoughts on like, you know, what we're seeing in terms of uh, projects uh, in Arbitrum engaging in the DAO and um, why that's exciting going forward. Cool. Yeah. Uh, before I actually go into like my spill, I do want to explicitly say that views are like my own. It's not representative of the Arbitrum Foundation. Just to make sure that I'm, I'm steering clear of the legal egos out there <laughs> that might pick uh, this apart. But, uh, yeah, overall at the Arbitrum ecosystem in general, I'd say it's been very encouraging to kind of like watch how it's all growing. So um, the Arbitrum DAO is relatively young. 
Um, it's, I believe like five months old since the airdrop, but we have seen an influx of like activities, governance proposals going on. And a lot of it is actually like grassroots and community driven, which is very refreshing, right? If you actually take a quick look around like other ecosystems and other DAOs, uh, it's an unfortunate fact that like, you know, a lot of the core teams and a lot of foundations are still very like, you know, hands-on and, you know, trying to direct how, how things kind of work, um, which in some cases, might be necessary just to get the ball rolling on stuff. But over on Arbitrum side, like um, the foundation, as well as off-chain labs, in my opinion, did not need to have like a strong presence at all, right? Like the, the community just got going. Everyone was super passionate, super involved. The delegates are literally debating almost every proposal that kind of hits forums and uh, goes on chain. And the level of activity is just insane. And just on the delegate front, like it's amazing. You're a delegate yourself, so you know that, right? Like, none of them are actually getting paid to do this, right? So the fact that they're so engaged is, like, beyond me. I'm like, what's really driving you to be so active, right? Like, there's nothing in it for you from a monetary standpoint. And when I speak to a lot of them, a lot of them just, like, just have so much high hopes for the ecosystem in general, so much so that they're willing to kind of forego um, that short-term monetary incentive for, like, the long-term um growth of the ecosystem per se which is super refreshing and something that i've honestly hardly seen in other ecosystems right so um all in all uh it's it's very grassroots driven um and as much as possible uh, my role at the foundation is trying to make governance as easy and as inclusive as possible so uh to your early point about like what i i do uh, over at the arbitrum foundation i actively uh, try to help out delegates and projects where I can, obviously in a neutral uh, manner, in a sense that I don't kind of like sway how a proposal runs or like sway community, um, what's that word, community like decisions or like frame of mind or mental models when thinking about certain proposals. But as much as possible, like I speak with a lot of delegates just trying to understand like what's top of mind for them, what are the challenges that they see and how we at the foundation can kind of help them uh, elevate themselves. Um, and at the same time for projects, you know, it's really understanding like what their goals are and whether we can help to make introductions to maybe some delegates or other projects just to, you know, help expand uh, their their size and their, their user base really quickly. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, it's all about like relationships manage management, I'd say. Um, obviously, like, you know, it's not just the delegates as well as um, the projects. There is also like the everyday like small team uh, that, you know, we are engaged with just trying to understand like how we can help them uh, from a tooling standpoint, uh, from a resources standpoint, and at the same time, like how can we actually introduce them to like the bigger names in the ecosystem. All in all, it's just trying to make governance a little bit more inclusive, trying to make building an ecosystem a little bit more appealing. Um, so yeah, I, I guess like that's a good TLDR of like my role. And I'm sorry if like I didn't get to like a specific point, but I think that's pretty good encapsulation of my role. <laughs> no, that that's great. And um, I can say as, as a delegate, it's very accurate. Like everything you said is very true. Um, tr truly like the DAO is very, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tr truly the DAO is very community driven um, somewhat by the delegates, but even more so, uh, you know, by just like builders in the Arbitrum ecosystem, which actually that's like one really interesting aspect of the Arbitrum DAO is those two groups are quite overlapping um, because Arbitrum did an airdrop to, uh, you know, as part of the kind of initial governance launch to active projects in the ecosystem. Um, there, there's kind of like this um, emerging, like really exciting incentive alignment, I think, or like governance alignment um, between like large delegates and large projects in the ecosystem. So um, I think, yeah, the the foundation is really helpful for like just threading some of those conversations together. Um, but but ultimately, like, yeah, most of the conversations I'm having are with just, you know, builders and other delegates who are just active, active in Arbitrum. So it's, it is very fun. Um, and as you say, refreshing. It's great to hear. And uh, I hope you can kind of like continue helping us, you know, to drive like further decentralization of the community, further decentralized governance. Uh, that's the angle, right? Like we don't want like two wheels, three wheels to kind of dictate how the DAO works. That's not the aim. 
um, ultimately, again, we want to make sure that it's an inclusive environment to build in, to govern, to take part, to have a voice. So yeah, it's voices like yourself, profiles like yourself that really make this happen. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. I'm curious um, if there's anything, any, if there are any topics in the Arbitrum DAO right now, like any either current proposals or just like uh, things that are kind of forming more towards a proposal that, that you would think are interesting. Um, I, I imagine like you don't have a position on them. So definitely not expecting you to say, like, <laughs> oh, like I like this proposal or something. Um, Cause that's obviously not the foundation's role, but just curious, like um, among kind of the most active topics in the Arbitrum DAO, what are some that you would highlight for people if they want to kind of dive in and get involved? For one, the security council elections are ongoing. That isn't exactly like a governance topic per se, but I guess we can dive into that a little bit later in this conversation. Another big topic that's ongoing is the short-term incentive program. So let me give like a quick history on, on this, this program and how it formed, right? So essentially Camelot, uh, which is a DEX on, uh, on, on Arbitrum, I believe they're native on Arbitrum. They actually uh, reached out to the DAO we have a proposal to request some funding for an incentive campaign. That proposal, unfortunately, not unfortunately, it, it got rejected. Um, but I, I think a lot of delegates and projects actually thought that this rejections was not for a good reason, right? So the main reason quoted was that there wasn't like an, a, a framework to kind of like evaluate and justify these incentive programs and the DAO should kind of wait on such a framework to form before like such incentive programs should be entertained. Um, which you know can be seen as a little bit counterintuitive because like as a DAO, like there we have a DAO treasury so a lot of projects are like then what's the treasury sitting there for like we need to act fast and again this is just like my views just want to be explicitly clear um you know in the grand scheme of thing, uh, things like the l2 wars are kind of like heating up um we've seen how a lot of these these l2s have been aggressive and trying to poach poach is is a pretty strong word but like attract builders uh, into their ecosystems uh, through such incentives. And, you know, a lot of these projects have a vested interest in Arbitrum and they really want to see Arbitrum succeed just because like the tech stack is solid and the ecosystem is superb, right? So, you know, if they can't get this right, then they did, they, they do foresee like a, an exodus of like builders, uh, which is, is, is just bad. So again, this is all grassroots. So a lot of these projects and delegates actually came together, formed a working group called the Short-Term Incentive Program Working Group. They actually held governance calls. They actually um, went on Miro and then brainstormed a lot of ideas. I was a part of uh, quite a few of them just as a spectator, just to see like how things played out. You know, I was just amazed at all these calls. And now they have actually passed snapshot where you know they got uh, 50 million um, from the Arbitrum Treasury to run a program for, for four months. Uh, and among uh, for, for this part of 15 million, like projects could actually come in right into them um, and then they would actually, uh, delegates would actually evaluate to see whether they would be deserving of the funds that they are asking for. So that's kind of like a short TLDR. I, I think like this is something that I have personally not seen before in any other DAOs, like literally something this big of a scale being completely community driven. Foundation and off-chain labs had no part in this at all. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just super excited because this is kind of like a, a sign of things to come in the ecosystem, like how grassroots it is and how decentralized it is. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I might've gone too deep on that. Other, I guess, like topics that I'm a little bit more excited about, uh, for the DAO to kind of discuss are the developments, um, from off-chain labs. So like, you know, things about stylus, you know, things about, um, about bold, about, you know, um, orbit chains. Um, and then most recently, like there was a, a, a research piece, uh, or rather a, a, a PR document, which kind of states that like off chain labs is working with espresso systems to explore like decentralized sequencing, uh, options for the Arbitrum, um, chains. So yeah, it, it'd be great if like, you know, the DAO can kind of like, you know, start some discussions on those and see, uh, whether it makes sense to adopt, uh, these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of thoughts just from my end as a delegate. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting and ultimately exciting to like observe and participate in kind of the arc of the incentive program because um, the first step of it was like, you know, okay, Camelot did a great job being proactive to bring a proposal to the DAO. And then the DAO rejected it, um, which was like, 
you know, on on the one hand, kind of like a bad start for incentives, but on the other hand, in some ways, like uh, established like the DAO as like you know, uh, or or like started the conversation, right? Like the <laughs> the DAO is like I don't know some kind of like legitimate um, governing body around these types of topics. Um, but what was exciting is like the 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 original proposal, like it really didn't lose by very much on snapshot. And like, you saw a lot of feedback from delegates around like, Hey, we actually want to do incentives, right? It's just like this proposal isn't quite something I can support. And then yeah, being part of the process of just evolving that into something that is, you know, currently on chain on tally, uh, and, uh, a proposal, pretty significant amount of ARB. Uh, it's like 50 million ARB. Uh, 50 million, which, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is like, a lot of money, especially like in these, this like, uh, you know, uh, economic climate in crypto, um, it, that I think that proposal has a like, very good chance, you know, of passing based on the snapshot and community support is, is super exciting. Um, so yeah, if you're a builder out there, like just know, even though, you know, uh, the Arbitrum DAO, you know, originally had some pushback on incentives, like, uh, it's definitely a place you can come to, to build and get rewarded for doing so or get help doing so. Um, yeah. And the, the second thing you mentioned in terms of technology upgrades, like that's, that's a really interesting, um, aspect of the Arbitrum DAO as well, where like, if you look at some of the other big protocols that are DAO managed, like they don't necessarily implement new protocol upgrades fully via the DAO, right? Like, whereas in Arbitrum, like the, the actual, like it's actually, you know, the, no, basically no new software is deployed, uh, outside of the DAO. Right. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. I feel like you mentioned there's some big ones coming up. Um, I'm curious your thoughts, like, you know, between stylus and bold and like shared sequencing, like these are all like really big and really technical and really complex topics. That I think the DAO is going to be grappling with like whether or not to, to vote for an upgrade, uh, on these things. Like what are your thoughts on how delegates like myself should like come up to speed on these topics? Um, and like, uh, how, like, how they should think about engaging with something like bold or stylus in terms of through the governance process? That's a big question. Um, so I probably have to go like into each, uh, aspect, uh, just to like, you know, vocalize my, my thoughts. So for stylus, I, I'd say it's, it's pretty simple. If I were to like do it in an Eli Fi explain like I'm fine format, it's basically, um, allowing developers who write on Rust, C and C++ to deploy smart contracts, which are compatible with the Solidity ones that are deployed right now, right? So that essentially opens doors to many more developers, many more millions, in fact, right? If I, if I read, uh, I, I actually was reading like a survey about like the number of developers. So for Solidity, I think there were only like a couple of tens of thousands um, globally, but for Rust itself, it's like in the millions, right? So just imagine like adopting um, stylus into like the Arbitrum DAO control chains, like how many more builders can actually come into the space. Um, so that's kind of like a, a good TLDR for like what stylus is right now it's in public testnet. Um, and yeah, I, we have a ton of developer docs available out there. So if you're a builder, uh, writing Rust, C or C++, especially the gaming ones, uh, on, on C++, because it's a unique language, um, check out stylus, man. Like it's, it's cool. And, um, yeah, come on chain. <laughs> Uh, so for bold, uh, essentially it's, uh, allowing for permissionless validation, right? So, uh, it's, it's gonna play a part in further decentralizing the Arbitrum, uh, protocol, right? So right now we have a permission set of, uh, 13 validators. Um, so what bold essentially allows for is for anyone to run the validator node. And we only need like one honest validator to, you know, correct the state of the chain. Um, essentially bold allows that, uh, that's again, like a quick TLDR. Um, and then what else was there? Uh, we were talking about like, uh, shared sequencing, uh, no decentralized sequencing with Espresso. Yeah. So currently, um, there is only one sequencer, one centralized sequencer for, uh, the Arbitrum DAO control chains. Um, and this research essentially, um, uh, with Espresso system explores like how that can be further decentralized. So whether it's through DBT or other forms of um, technologies that Espresso has. Um, Off-Chain Labs is actively working on them to kind of like see whether it makes sense and coming up with like a implementation. But whether the DAO kind of adopts it is 
another question that delegates like yourself have to ponder about, right? Just because as of right now, again, my personal opinion is that, you know, all the sequencer revenue actually accrues to the DAO, right? So um, from delegate standpoint and from a, I don't know, um, a stakeholder in the Optrum DAO, like, you know, do you want to, you know, decentralize that portion? And then, I don't know, think about, you know, how the sequencer fees might, you know, be dispersed. I don't know, you know, there, there's just like a lot of thoughts that I probably need to kind of like flesh out myself uh, as to like how the DAO and delegates would kind of think about this. But I guess it's all a good step towards like further decentralizing um, protocol from end to end. Um, and to your point about like overall, how delegates should kind of like approach all these like a little bit more technical topics, I'd say like, you know, on our end, we'll work um, pretty closely with, I'd say like off-chain labs to produce more content around um, a lot of these like new developments. Um, and then we will also be um, having potentially AMAs and um, maybe even sit downs with delegates just to, you know, go in depth and let them know exactly like what all of these are so that they can make an informed decision on whether the DAO should adopt them or not. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to checking it out. I think it'll be a great opportunity for everyone in the Arbitrum community to familiarize themselves with kind of what's at the bleeding edge of the roll up tech tech ecosystem. Um, awesome. Well, one topic you mentioned earlier um, that I would love to kind of close on is Security Council elections. So mm -hmm. this is a governance topic that is active right now. Um, if you are a member of the Arbitrum community, especially if you have voting power delegated to you, um, it's something you should be aware of and invested in. So we'd love to close there. Uh, Clifton, just tell us more about the Arbitrum Security Council election, um, what's happening with it and why it matters. Yeah, so uh, let me take a step back and explain like what Security Council is for anyone who doesn't really uh, know what it is. So essentially, uh, Security Council is a committee of 12 members and they are responsible for authorizing emergency upgrades if there's a need for one, right? So right now, DAO proposals can be submitted by anyone. They're transparent and are deliberately designed to kind of like take weeks to finalize. Um, this actually allows delegates like yourself to vote on the proposal and ensures that, you know, if the proposal passes, users can actually have the opportunity to opt out by withdrawing their funds before it kind of takes effect. But, you know, we, we live in software world where like bugs and hacks are like so apparent everywhere. So some upgrades actually need to happen really quickly. Right. And these upgrades, uh, actually are the ones that fix, uh, fix critical bugs discovered in the systems. And for this class of upgrades, I think quick effectuation is necessary to ensure that no attacker can kind of exploit the vulnerability once it is public. And um, essentially, this is what the Security Council is for. It's to really identify these bugs and these malicious hacks uh, and implement a solution ASAP without going through the whole governance process, uh, which is like, is end to end probably like at least 22 days. Um, as of today, I'm happy to say that, you know, all upgrades have been carried out via the DAO proposal path. No emergency upgrades have been necessary, but, you know, given the known unknown risk of like undiscovered bugs, having an emergency upgrade contingency plan is vital, right? And Security Council is trusted to only ever use its ability to recover from emergencies. Um, yeah, so that's like a good TLDR of what Security Council is. Um, <clears throat> so the Security Council make up uh, again, it's 12 members and they're actually divided into two cohorts of six each. Cohort one is actually up for election right now, right? So how election works is um, every elected security member's term lasts for one year, excluding the, um, and essentially anyone in the DAO can kind of put themselves up to be a candidate for a security council, right? So to put, uh, to, to become a nominee, an official nominee, you have to have support from at least like 0.2% of all votable tokens. Um, and then, um, the, the, essentially the six candidates who received the most votes will be elected to be, uh, on the, the cohort one of the security council, which is up for election right now. So there are quite a few phases in the en entire election process. We are currently in the compliance check phase. Um, so the nominee selection phase has ended, um, we've identified 24 out of 41 nominees that have at least 0.2%, uh, of voting power, right? Uh, the, com the, the foundation is undergoing like a compliance check on all these 24 names at the moment. And then post that, uh, the elections will officially begin for the 24 people, uh, 24 nominees. So that's kind of like a good TRDR of the election process.
Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. One, one, one aspect of Arbitrum Security Council election that I think is really compelling um, is that the, the only party that's trusted with at, like electing people um, and removing them from the multi-sig is the DAO itself. Um, and this is a really important distinction relative to a lot of councils kind of that you see out there in the DAO ecosystem today, where um, it's it's common to have a council that has some kind of like elevated or special power, like in the case of Arbitrum, the ability to like uh, ship fixes quickly. Um, uh, but but typically or often you see a pattern where like the 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 process of like uh giving that power is kind of separated from the DAO, right um what's really cool about arbitrum is um the there's kind of this like uh autonomous protocol that creates an on-chain election every six months and like automatically pulls six you know one of the cohort or six of the members off um and and you know creates uh this mechanism to elect new ones um so i think that's something that's like really important to kind of understand um about about arbitrum is like the DAO is in control right so um yeah definitely like as a delegate and a, a participant in the community make sure you weigh in uh on round two and uh yeah elect the people that you trust to be on the council 100 percent. like you know elections are so important because they democratically determine who are responsible for being diligent and security integrity of the DAO. right so um to your point, like by holding regular elections, the community can kind of ensure that the council is made up of members who truly represent the values enshrined um, within the constitution. Um, and <clears throat> I guess like over time, I, something that the DAO can kind of discuss is how um, this council can evolve potentially to be a little bit more decentralized because we have heard uh, criticisms about the security council model. Like, you know, what if, 12 of them actually collude and then like they decide to like take off with like a bulk of funds like there's nothing the DAO can kind of do to kind of stop that so th this might be a topic for like the DAO to kind of discuss as well um ultimately you gotta you know weigh the pros and cons um yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely well um yeah keep an eye out for security council elections uh you know there are probably the second round uh, or the the ultimate voting for who goes on this upcoming cohort of the council will uh will go live right around when this podcast comes out um so look for that but uh on that note it's probably uh that's probably a good place to wrap on the arbitrum DAO specifically and we'll move to our closing questions that we have for sure before we uh go on i i do want to give a big big shout out to telly telly did an amazing job building a ui to facilitate this whole elections UI and UX is so, so important in Web3. Like, this is an, a, a big area that, like, everyone needs to improve on. Tally does an amazing job at that. So kudos to you guys. So head to Tally, look at the security elections, and cast your votes there. Oh, man. Thanks, Clifton. Well, equal shout out, um, yeah, especially to, like, Off-Chain Labs on, uh, and, and the foundation on building an amazing primitive that we could integrate our front end with. Um, so, yeah, right back at you. Um, cool. <laughs> cool. Always happy to be interrupted for a tally shout out. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks Clifton. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, we'll move into a closing question that we have for everyone, which is a two parter. What's your favorite and your least favorite part of working in the ecosystem or just like something you think we need to work on together? UI and UX. I, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big like advocate for better UI and UX. So I believe that's like the main blocker as to like what's holding back masses from coming into crypto and coming into web three in general. Um, and if I can add another one, it's like, it's time for applications to come in right now. We have all the infrastructure ready. We need the applications. Um, obviously those two points are kind of overlapping because we need to ensure that these applications have great UI and UX. Um, so just think about it from this sense. Like if you want your mom or like your grandma, grandma to kind of like start using crypto, what would that process be? What would that flow be? I'm tapping on kind of like my product um, background, but that like, what would that process be? Design it in a way that they can get onboarded in a few clicks, right? Like abstract away all the private key stuff, abstract away like all the message signings and stuff um, and make it easy for people to use, but not compromise on security. It's a, it's a big ask, but like, I, I think that is kind of like what's holding um, the entire industry back. 
Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited because I've been speaking to a lot of different builders and this is something that they're actively prioritizing. Um, what I, I guess that's what I like about working in this space as well. Like, you know, speaking with many different builders, understanding what they, they have plans for, what their roadmaps are and understanding like how we as a foundation, as a bit, uh, as a building block can kind of help them, um, get there, um, whether it's through technical ways or whether it's through co-marketing, right. Um, Ultimately, we want to see builders succeed, and um, I'm very excited to say that even though we're in the bear market, uh, we are building a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, this this like whole enthusiasm, this positivity, this uh, level of like building is very very encouraging to me. It's what keeps me going on an everyday basis. What I don't like about you know working crypto right now, I'd say is I don't know. I, I feel like you know crypto Twitter especially it can be quite toxic. <laughs> like I, I think maybe it's. A, a result of like nothing on the price movement front, but like it seems like everyone's angry at, at something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it can be quite like demoralizing to, to look through Twitter um, within the ecosystem at the same time, like, you know, as much as like, uh, as is it, it is important to be inclusive. I think it's important to also, you know, call out bad actors, call out individuals who are derogatory um, and unfortunately, like every ecosystem, Arbitrum included, has some of these characters. So um, it's it's unfortunate to see that uh, build, bringing down some of the builders. But uh, yeah, it's something that we have to we have to improve on. Absolutely, absolutely, um, absolutely love it on the builder side. Um, and yeah, UI UX is a huge focus for us at Tally as well. Um, just trying to figure out how to make it so if you want to participate in governance, you can just like go to tally.xyz and just go um, and Word. abstracting away all, <laughs> all the on-chain stuff. Um, it's, yeah. you know, it's a big task, but, uh, exciting. Yeah. We have a lot of exciting stuff coming to, to make that happen. Um, so yeah, uh, love that answer. And then, yeah, just to close us out, um, maybe something that's not crypto related, although it can be if you wanted to, uh, which is what is your favorite place in the world and why? It's a small little diner on the east side of, of Singapore. That's where I actually met my wife, who I've known for like the past 13 years. Uh, fun fact, she's actually, I mean, people might call me a loser for this, but I, I don't see myself as one, but she's actually the only like girl and woman I've ever dated and I've married to her right now. We have a newborn. So uh, where we first met will always be close and dear to my heart. <laughs> No way. That's so wholesome. There's no way. It is. No one can ever make fun of you for that. <laughs> that's wholesome AF, as they say. Dude, I, have, I, I, I have people coming up to me and like, you've never dated another girl in your whole life. You're missing out. But I'm like, you know, I'm happy with what I have. Like, you know, the grass can be always green on the other side, but you've got to appreciate what you have at the moment, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And congratulations on the newborn Thank as you. well. That's amazing. Thank you. Sleepless cool. nights, sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't know how you do it, like with managing time zones and uh, yeah, having a newborn. Um, shout out to you for for everything you do for the DAO. Thank you. I think we need a big shout out to all crypto dads out there. You are included in that, by the way, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm like moving a little bit out of the new newborn stage. Um, it's been almost a year, but yeah. <laughs> shout out to the crypto dads for sure, for sure. Shout out to the crypto dads and moms too. <laughs> and moms, moms too, yeah. yeah. The crypto and parents. Moms, yeah. Um, you should. Are you are you in Mad DAO? Um, I think it's. Mom and Dad DAO? I forgot what the acronym is for exactly. Um, no way. There's yeah. such a thing? Yeah. It's, I don't know, like, it's kind of a, um, it's a pretty tight-knit group, so I don't exactly know how you get access, um, but Denison, the way I joined was Denison from Tally, um, I think is like a founding person or was a, a uh -huh. very early, so um, yeah, that's a, it's a good crew. There's a lot of, like, very great crypto people in there posting wholesome parenting content. <laughs> I, I have no idea how to even search for that. I just searched like mom and dad down, nothing came up. I searched mom da uh, mad down, nothing came up too. So it's, yeah, it's pretty Shoot low key. Link, yeah. I think I think it's basically <laughs> just a Telegram group. Um, so yeah, I'll, oh, okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll try to figure out how you get how you get an invite. Um. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I gotta exchange some like wholesome content with other people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Clifton, thank you so much for joining Dow Talk. Um, appreciate everything you do, and I'll see you in the in the Arbitrum Dow. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Have a lot of fun. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.